This week on Small Town Big Deal. How one town goes hog wild for America's most misunderstood breakfast meat. It tastes like, like meat, like I don't know. And then, how about them apples? We take to the orchard to find out what makes for the perfect peck. Also, braving the fire to light up the night. How neon lit the path for a small town to become a city of lights. Welcome to Small Town Big Deal. I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. And we're in the small town of Bridgeville, Delaware, a town that kind of exploded overnight. That's because of a festival celebrating two of the major food groups. Representing fruit? The apple. As for meat, well, it's something we've never heard of before, but it's been a delicacy in these parts for over 400 years. Scrapple. For nearly 30 years, on the second weekend in October, the tiny town of Bridgeville, Delaware, population about 2,500, becomes the culinary capital of the Mid-Atlantic, drawing close to 35,000 visitors for its annual Apple Scrapple Festival. Good evening, Bridgeville, and welcome to the 28th annual Bridgeville Apple Scrapple Festival. The event highlights the two things Bridgeville is best known for. First, it's abundant apple crop. And second, it's historic reputation as being home to the largest Scrapple company in the world. Now, if you're asking just what the heck is Scrapple, you're not alone. So if someone had never tasted Scrapple before, how would you describe it? I mean, it tastes like, like meat, like I don't know. I think it's kind of, I don't know, it's hard. It's kind of like, it's, it's kind of mushy in the middle. All I like to say is, is you just have to try it. It's delicious. If you love pork, you're going to love Scrapple. If you like bacon, if you like pork sausage, I mean, really, Scrapple is like having sausage without the casing, you know? Food writer Amy Strauss literally wrote the book on Scrapple. Her bestseller, Pennsylvania Scrapple, A Delectable History, is the definitive work on the dish, which dates back to the 1600s when German settlers first came to Pennsylvania. Waste not, want not was their guiding principle. People had made it from the leftover scraps from butchering day. And then you would boil down the leftover meat pieces with the bones. And then from there, you would pick the bones out and then you would grind up the meat. There was a lot of pieces of the pork in it. So people would be like, everything but the oink, or sometimes the oink yeah. was in there. So. <laughs> literally. Uh, yeah, literally. All that porky goodness was then blended with cornmeal, buckwheat flour, and spices. And the resulting grayish brownish mush was formed into loaves, sliced, and pan fried. It was a breakfast meat that people were able to sustain themselves through cold winters, and so they could make big loaves of it and cut it off and eat it for breakfast and not have to eat till dinner. In fact, legend has it that Scrapple was the original breakfast of champions. So I understand that Scrapple has sort of a, a historical involvement with the founding father of America. That's very true. George Washington, our first U.S. president, one of his go-to items at his encampment in Valley Forge was Scrapple. Maybe Scrapple helped us win the revolution. <laughs> there you go. So who knew George Washington had Scrapple at Valley Forge? John Curtis is the sales manager at Rappa Haberset, the largest scrapple maker in the country. They've been at it here in Bridgeville since 1926. Scrapple in this area, in many cases, in many stores, outsells all the sausage products in the case, and in many cases, even most of the bacon items. Oh, whoa, wait, wait, wait. wait. Bacon? Oh, if it beats bacon, it's got to be good. <laughs> and when it comes to brand loyalty, Scrapple aficionados are extremely territorial. In Delaware, Maryland, that's a Rappa lover there. So as you go up into Pennsylvania, New Jersey, you might have more preference to our Haverset brand, and that brand is since 1863. Now, which is better, 
Pennsylvania Scrapple or Delaware Scrapple? Oh my God, you just wasted that <laughs> breath on me. My goodness, if I say anything else, they'll be able to boot you all out of, and me out of town. Volunteer Butch Lord has been slinging Scrapple at the festival for years. Uh, go ahead. Are these ready to flip? Yeah, right here, right there. So, when in Rome, a little hip action. <laughs> Well done. There you go. Well done, well Good done. Job. You did it so well. Give it some charisma. Oh, that. that one's almost ready to take off, right? Almost as important as how to cook Scrapple is what to put on Scrapple. Egg and cheese, always. No hesitation. Nope. I like to put eggs and cheese, and sometimes I'll put syrup. I put jelly on mine. What flavor of jelly? Strawberry. I like grape jelly on mine. Because I just talked to a strawberry jelly man. Yeah. <laughs> like so many others, Charles Roach grew up eating Scrapple. To him, it's more than comfort food. It represents community, way of life rooted in tradition. It was like an event. Yeah, it was like an event. Big family get together. Yeah. It was like a big day event, just like this. But after cooking close to a thousand pounds of it for the festival, even Charles has had enough. So when I get done with this, I'm going I'm to walk around and try somebody else's food. You're not going to have a scrapple sandwich. No. <laughs> not today. Not, to, not today. And when we come back, we finally get our first taste of this magical meat. Okay, you want to go first? Then, take cover. Y'all watch out. Jan lets loose in the cast iron skillet toss. Plus, picking the perfect apple from Delaware's oldest orchard. Man, look at that one. Oh, that's nice, yeah. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. We are still in Bridgeville, Delaware at the Apple Scrapple Festival. We learned a lot about Scrapple, but now it's time for the apple. So we have come to the oldest apple orchard in Delaware. You know, kind of test our apple IQ. Ooh, there's a good one. And did you know that there are over a hundred different varieties of apples in the United States? Mm. Oh, like Granny Smith, Gala, Fuji, and have you ever heard of the Arkansas Black Twig? No, but it looks pretty good. You want a bite? That is good. I don't think we're gonna bite it. More than anyone else in town, Charlie Smith is the man who puts the apple in the Apple Scrapple Festival. How many different apples do you grow? I grow right now around 10 varieties. Good to see you. Charlie's a fourth generation family farmer and co-owner of T.S. Smith & Sons. His great grandfather started it back in 1907. And today, they're the oldest apple grower in Delaware. What are the top, say, five most popular apples? Fuji being number one, probably. Pink Lady is another great one. Honeycrisp is the one everybody wants, and it's the toughest one to grow. <laughs> So now when you're picking, you're going to leave some of them. You're not just going to go through right. and pick everything. We, we call it spot picking. We do that with most all our fruit. We'll pick uh, five times. There you go. Oh, no, not that one. There, there you go. Oops. Oops. A good picker, he can pick 100 bushels a day. I wouldn't be a good picker. Oh, <laughs> good catch. And after all that picking, there are some definite mm. rewards. Back at the orchard market, we got to sample all the farm fresh baked goodies. From apple cider donuts, to apple turnovers, to my personal favorite, apple dumplings. I'm glad I don't live near here, because I'd, I'd weigh about 400 pounds. So truth be told, Rodney ate all the rest of all that apple taste test and stuff. Not me, it's Rodney's. And it was good. <laughs> But the Apple Scrapple Festival is more than just a good opportunity to pick out on tasty treats. There's the opening night's big event, the Little Miss Apple Scrapple Contest, and a contest for the sky's the limit, for skillets that is, the ladies' cast iron skillet toss competition. From Small Town Big Deal, please welcome Jan Carl. You know how bad I throw. Low and right down the you know I'm you a terrible it. thrower. You got it. I'm a terrible Now, I'll be the first to admit I'm not very good at anything that involves catching or throwing, let alone chunking five pounds of cast iron. Y'all watch out. Come on, Jan, you can do it. You can do it. Here's the wind up and the pitch. Hey, nice. 
The judges come onto the field to measure the throw. And the throw for Jan Carl, 43 feet, Not bad. 9 inches. Decent. Good job. I didn't embarrass myself, so I'm happy. Let's go have some scrapple. Our first scrapple. Okay, let's go together. Okay, chewing. Wait for it. It has a te different texture, a little bit like sausage, but not the same texture as sausage. It is like creamy in the middle. Yeah. I wasn't sure what to expect, but it is good. Scrapple pizza. But why stop with just a scrapple sandwich? Could we try it out scrapple pizza? Thank good. You. Thank you. And even scrapple brats. Oh, yeah. That's good. That's the best I've had. It is. Scrapple is also keeping up with the times and changing attitudes about food. Besides Rapa's best-selling original pork recipe, the company now also offers turkey, beef, and hot and spicy varieties. And trendy upscale restaurants from Philadelphia to Brooklyn are also finding new ways to include it on their menus. I was just at a restaurant the other night, and in Philadelphia you can find it on menus, even on dinner menus. Really? As a fun appetizer smeared on a crostini, and oh. it's still really fun to enjoy it in a new way. But what Bridgeville's Apple Scrapple Festival is really about is pulling together as a community. It's staffed entirely by volunteers. And Rapa donates all the Scrapple that local organizations sell at the festival, which they in turn use to give back to the community. Thank you. The Cheer Center has the Scrapple booth over here. They raised enough money in two years to pay for the van that supplies their home dinners. I mean, that's what it's about. We talk about how fun it is. We're celebrating Scrapple. We're celebrating the apple harvest. But what you just said about the Senior Center and yeah. them being able to buy their van to yeah. provide dinners. And okay. that's why I ate two apple dumplings instead of just well, one, just to support. See, I'm glad I helped you out. This is for a good cause. Yeah, it is a good cause. <laughs> when we come back, let there be light. The art, science, and people that keep the neon capital of the world aglow. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. You know, Las Vegas, Nevada doesn't necessarily conjure up the idea of a small town. But on the far end of the famous strip lies a smaller community of sorts. You could say it's light years away from the Vegas of today. So when you come here, you step back in time. We start our tours over at the Golden Nugget sign where it says 1906, that was the founding of Las Vegas. The Neon Museum sheds light on the history of Las Vegas through signs, from humble to huge. These signs grew up with the city and helped make it famous. For its first couple decades, Las Vegas was just a sleepy town train stopped at between Los Angeles and Salt Lake City. Then in 1931, two things happened. Construction started on the massive Hoover Dam, about 30 miles away, and Las Vegas legalized gambling. Vegas started growing fast, as did Marquee Mania. The neon really was your calling card. Oh, absolutely. That's why the signs got bigger and bigger and bigger to call you in, come and stay at my motor lodge. Yeah. And so they were competing with each other. It wasn't just businesses that were using neon. It was actually small businesses also. Our Steiner Happy Shirt, that was a business of, run by a family. And they started incorporating neon to get you to come in and do business with them. When an immigrant from England saw what was happening here, you could say a light bulb went off in his head. Tom Young was actually just a sign painter and did beautiful sign painted signs. Fortunately for all of us, he was an entrepreneur and uh, adopted the electric sign industry right at its very beginning. And uh, you know, all the work that we did caught the attention of the mobsters in uh, Las Vegas. And next thing you know, we were uh, designing and building beautiful signs for the casinos. <laughs> now, three generations of Tom Young's family have run Yesco, which stands for Young Electric Sign Company. They're huge. They've created many of Las Vegas's iconic signs, from the very famous Welcome to Fabulous Las Vegas sign to most of the stunning signs now on display at the Neon Museum. 
we kept imploding things, destroying signs, and some concerned citizens realized we're getting rid of our history, we need to start saving that, and that's when the Neon Museum was born. Some of the biggest lights come to rest here in outdoor display known as the Neon Boneyard. By day, they can look a little low energy, but once the sun goes down, it's as if they come back to life. Towering over the whole scene is the 82-foot guitar that once welcomed visitors to the Hard Rock Cafe. Ed Stagner was a salesman when the call came into Yesco 30 years ago. He says, Ed, we want to do, uh, we're bringing the cafe in, we want to do a new sign there. I said, well, come meet with us and let's go from there. And then when did he say how many feet tall he was? Well, that, that just kind of evolved as, <laughs> as the building evolved, the sign Did you upsell got, him? Got a, well, maybe. <laughs> Who wants a 20-foot guitar when you when can you have an 80-foot guitar? An 80-foot guitar. <laughs> and do you know how many feet of neon? There's about 4,000 feet of neon. And when it comes to creating a gigantic neon sign, you can't just make it up as you go. First, you need to think it through, design it so it looks good from the ground, and engineer it so it will stay safely in place. Then it's time for Yesco's neon artists to get to work. Only instead of working in paint or clay, they work in glass and fire. This is your blow hose. That's the thing that goes in my mouth. Eric Elizondo learned neon tube bending from his father. And he's been doing it for over 40 years. If I was going to make a bend or something, you blow just a very little bit. Because if you don't blow and you heat it up, what happens? It, it gets flat and kind of collapses. But it's kind of like getting a straw and you try to bend it, how it just kind of keeps. Yeah. Yeah. That's what would happen. OK. Emboldened by Eric's enlightening demonstration, Jan and I tried our hands at bending glass. Well, I can feel it getting loose. Keep rolling it around. Ah! OK. Come out. Yeah! I put that. This kind of work would make me nervous to do it all day long. Perfect. Perfect. You got a perfect. You got a perfect. You got a 10. Now it's my turn to rotate the glass tube in the flame. That's hot. Uh oh. Oh no. You're fed up. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right. You can come out and try it. Come out. No, see, mine's crooked. The, mine belongs to the island of misfit neon. You're a natural. Yeah. I don't I think so. <laughs> My bottom's flat. <laughs> hey, Jan did pretty good. She didn't, like, turn it all the way around. She only got it hot on one side, like I'm an expert. I got better. <laughs> yeah, right. I got better. You don't mind if I don't believe you. It's not mine. <laughs> The rainbow of colors in neon light are made by combining different chemical coatings inside the glass tubes. Ooh, ah. Oh. When the electricity flows, neon glows. <gasps> For me, neon is like taking art and science and mixing it all up together to get something beautiful. And here in Las Vegas, beautiful neon signs lit the path for a small town oasis in the middle of the desert to grow into a big city whose bright, colorful, and creative lights are famous all over the world. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Small Town Big Deal. You know, life really is this long journey of learning, and sometimes I'm really surprised at what I don't know. Like, I had never heard of Scrapple, not even like, yeah. at all. Me either, I mean, but can you believe the passion around that food? And talk about apples, I mean, Charlie, he's kept the family farm alive, not only sustaining it, but he's actually growing it. Then out west in Las Vegas, we learned how old-fashioned, hands-on craftsmanship mixes with chemistry to make the world's most amazing neon signs. I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. Join us again next week when once again we celebrate the great stories from across America. People want to know where their food's coming from. They want to talk to the grower. Um, and being a farmer anymore, it's kind of like being a rock star. There's so few of us, you know. So they go, man, that guy's really a farmer, you know. You don't want to know about it, but we can tell you about what scrap is, but you don't want to know how it's made. Yeah. Keep that a secret and enjoy yeah. it.